seconds. All right, then, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back to Shaded and Filtered uh, with the newest episode here. Gene Panasenko, your host. Uh, can't tell you how much I appreciate the feedback that I've been getting through emails and text messages. My contact information obviously is posted uh, on the headliner of this website, but it's pretty incredible to see the channel that uh, was launched just about eight months back and we're getting in any way between 600 up to 1700 views for some of the episodes. So truly appreciate you spreading the word out, you know, through LinkedIn and uh, all the social media channels. Uh, again, in an effort of bringing the best talent of spreading the best uh, of the best uh, pearls of wisdom, uh, we invite some of the most accomplished business people, corporate executives, attorneys, CPAs, really all in an effort to inspire folks out there who are considering getting this in business or who have been running the business. And especially in the last year and a half, as the whole country pretty much has been going through this insanity with the lockdowns and what have you, it is really great to get some breath of fresh air from wonderful guests that we keep bringing to the channel. So I'm honored to bring you the next guest. And uh, let me ask you a question first. Do you know of anyone who worked with both Sir Elton John or Elon Musk? He sent people down to see the wreck of the Titanic on the seabed. He closed museums in Florence for a private dinner party and then had Andrea Bocelli serenade the guests while they ate their pasta. Well, you will meet him in a second. Quoted as the real life Wizard of Oz by Forbes and Entrepreneur Magazine, Mr. Steven Sims is the best selling author with Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen, sought after coach and speaker at a variety of networks, groups, and associations, as well as the Pentagon and Harvard, twice at the latter places. <laughs> Mr. Steve Sims, welcome to the channel. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. No, hey, you know, we connected a couple of months back, but between your schedule and my schedule, you know, we have been trying and trying again, but uh, great to connect with you here. And uh, yeah, look, I mean, you are the gentleman who needs uh, little, if any, introduction. You dominate, <laughs> you, you dominate the media. You have a great, you know, presence all over from Instagram to YouTube channel. But more importantly, you really have been out there representing some of the biggest names in the corporate world. Um, for the people who have been living uh, in a cave over the last about 20 years or 25 years, please introduce yourself and let them uh, and let them know about your business and how you got in this business. Well, it's not so much that they were living under a rock or anything. It's the fact that I made a point of making sure that I wasn't known to a multitude of people. You see, I grew up in East London. I'm here living in Los Angeles now. You're kidding me. I, I thought that's from Alabama, the accent you got. Yeah, I know. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I grew up in London, uh, was born basically directly into a bricklaying firm. So I left school at 15, went straight onto my dad's building site. And I realized I didn't have any money. I didn't mind working hard. You know, I was getting up at four o'clock in the morning. Well, I said I didn't mind it. At the age of like 15 and 16, I thought I was going to die through lack of sleep, <laughs> but um, I would get up at four, five o'clock in the morning and come home wet and cold and hurt and bruised at eight o'clock at night. So I knew how to do a hard day's manual work, but I had no money. And so I wasn't, I wasn't frightened of working hard, but I wasn't getting the accomplishment out of it. And so that launched me into trying to find out a little bit more about how people make money. So for that reason, I didn't want to brand myself. I didn't want to market myself. I just wanted to get in a room with a rich person and go, hey, how are you rich and I'm not? And those were the first crude uh, approaches I made. I would approach rich people and say, hey, how come you got money and I haven't? Um, and as this was happening, they needed things. And so I became this guy. I'd be, oh, I can take care of that for you. So I assumed the role of solving their problems. And a lot of wealthy people, they needed to get into parties. They needed to throw parties. They needed to hang out with celebrities. They needed to get into award shows. I became the guy that did it. Now, at the early stages, I got a lot of no's. And then I got less no's. And then I got more yeses. And so over a 25-year period, I started to become really good and I, w I launched the world's uh, most recognized uh, experiential concierge 
to billionaires. So a lot of people didn't know who I was. And I joked that I was probably the most connected person that you've never heard of. Um, and that was fine. But then about three or four years ago, I launched uh, a book called Blue Fishing. Uh, became got, a huge, which became a huge bestseller, as we both know. Well, that was the daft thing. I got approached to write the book. I never thought I could write a book. And if anyone ever gets an email from me, they know I can't write. Um, <laughs> so when I got asked, hey, you know, we've heard your story. Would you write a book? I was like, uh, yeah, do I get paid? And so they said yes, and I got a very good deal. So I thought to myself, well, this is great. I've got a good you know, checkbook here uh, to write the book. I don't know if it would be any good, but I'm going to tell people exactly how I've done it, you know, how I do things, how I think. And so I tried to build a very transparent, honest, impactful book that doesn't care about, you know, how brilliant I am. It cares about what I've learned can make you brilliant. Um, and the first couple of months, it did okay. In fact, it did borderline bad. But, you know, it was like, eh. and I remember phoning up my publisher going, hey, how are we doing? And they said to me, don't call us again. We'll call you. And I was <laughs> like, oh, dear, that's not good. And then the third month, it just took off. Um, and then it got, um, it got bought out in um, uh, China. Thailand, Korea, and when I say bought out, they bought, it was so successful in those regions, they bought the rights of the book and translated it into the language. So it's been bought out and translated in China, Thailand, Vietnam, Korea, uh, Poland. In Poland, it sold out all of its copies in two hours. No kidding. Um, and it's just uh, about, I think, 10 days ago, maybe 15 days ago, got released in Russia. Uh, in Russian. So well, yeah, you had a post on the Instagram that I like, yeah. as you have noticed, you know, it, it's in Cyrillic. Uh, having grown in Ukraine, I, I'm bilingual because, again, I come from the capital. In the suburbs, you know, very few people, they speak any Russian, you know, coming from the capital. It's like in Hong Kong, everybody speaks both Cantonese and yeah. English. So it was very similar when I checked your Instagram post, you know, just the other day. Holy cow, that looks like Russian. Congratulations. Yeah, it was, it was astonishing. And I've made sure that anyone that buys the rights has to send me a copy of the book because I just like to look at it. Um, but it was, it's been fascinating to see that what I do that is very simple, very simple, very impactful. I focus on impact. I focus on simplicity. I focus on transparency. Um, and if it's not easy to do, I don't do it. But I've been stunned at how many people in the planet don't do it that way. They try to overcomplicate things. And so the book ended up kind of getting some traction. And as you've said, did really, really well. And it's still going. No, this is truly fascinating. And again, I applaud all your successes, including but not limited to this latest edition, you know, in the Eastern Europe. Central and the Eastern Europe between Poland and, and Russia. It's incredible uh, to see the appetite of the people from uh, pretty much all over, the, uh, all over the world. You mentioned, mm. uh, you know, Central and Eastern Europe. You mentioned Asia. Uh, you know well that I spent uh, well over 25 years as a financial advisor. And out of those years, I spent eight years uh, through Hong Kong, Shanghai, Bancorp Corp as a vice president of wealth management. So many, many, many of my clients over years, they have been Asians, even ever since I left, you know, HSBC, many of my clients, they chose to stay with me as I decided to stay independent advisor, not to represent the entity, the institution, but represent the client yeah. and avoid any conflict of interest. But uh, through my business, I've been traveling very extensively through that part of the world that you're referring to, you know, from Hong Kong, where, by the way, you got in a business, that's how you started, I guess, mm -hmm. your your, your, your global domination path, if you will, uh, but it really gave you an exposure of life completely different from Newcastle, uh, wonderful UK, but completely different everything, you know, uh, mentality and, and what have you, culture. So it, it really, I guess, it put the first bricks, again, no pun intended, but that was your original line of business, the, the brick layer. But again, it, it really coupled together with your desire to really create your future, right? Not waiting for the things to fall in your lap. 
You just grab the things by the horn and you pursue that. And through your persistency and obviously the work ethics, diligence, focus, transparency, being a straightforward and you know, transparent professional is not that uh, common nowadays, unfortunately. A lot of businesses that are trying to get paid like today, you know, yesterday, you know, cutting corners. And this is not the way to build a reputable, long lasting business. You obviously have your own formula. And I would love you to share with our audience uh, about how you came up with the concept of this, uh, you know, uh, global concierge, if you will. Uh, you mentioned you're not really looking to become the most, uh, you know, uh, posted celebrity, if you will, or somebody who is working with celebrities all across the board, but you're catering to a very high-end clientele who has very exquisite and very unique needs. So I would love you to speak about, again, take us all the way back 25 years back as you came up with the whole concept, why there was a need for your line of business, Steve. Wow, that's uh, that's that's big. That's a big question. Um, well, you're a big guy, so that's I, yeah. I didn't I didn't know there was a need. Okay, I didn't know there was a need for me. I knew there was a need from me. So let me rephrase that. I remember one day, very clear day, and I've always ridden motorcycles, and I still ride motorcycles. Yeah, I love two wheels. I remember being on a motorbike in London. And I was at this pub with my mates and I looked around the pub and I realized everyone in the pub was broke. You know, we had enough money for maybe two beers. We had a motorbike that needed servicing, maybe new tires. There was no money in this bar whatsoever. And I thought I'm in this bar. I'm part of the cog. I'm part of this machine. I'm part of this room. Right. So I thought to myself then, if I want to have money and to understand how to make money, the first thing I've got to do is be in a room where people make money. So I changed my environment. Now I straight away went on a long journey over the next two to four years of failing. I thought, well, if I want to, if I want to talk to a rich person, I need to work in a job with rich people like your job, finance, stockbroking insurance, jet charters, yacht charters, you know, high-end real estate. I tried all of these jobs to try and get me to have conversations with affluent people. But I'm not very good at money. I'm not very good at selling jets and, and yachts and stuff like that. I'm not very good at being precocious and laughing at jokes that aren't very funny. I'm actually not very good with people. You know, because if someone says something that's stupid, I'm going to go, well, that's stupid. Yeah, you know, you're in New York. Yeah, you know, I think that's why I get on well, well, so well with New Yorkers. If you're a dumbass, I'm going to say you're a dumbass. We have a lot of similarities, yeah. Bingo. Yeah, you do, some, you do something stupid in New York and they tell you it's stupid. That's what I like. Um, <laughs> so that was my attitude. So I got, I got into the job and then I would lose the job very quickly. And I got the job as a stockbroker in Hong Kong. And I flew from London to Hong Kong and I lasted like two days. That's quite a um, flight. We both know it's not flying from Newcastle to you know, oh Edinburgh. Oh my right? God, yeah. So it's a long old flight. So I did that. And then I suddenly, I got the worst job in the world. I got a job as a doorman of a nightclub. It wasn't even a really good nightclub. And that was still in Hong Kong, right, Steve? Yeah, in... Uh, in uh, um, uh, um, oh, Wan Chai, and uh, the club was right. called Neptunes. Um, that, that, that's a famous area of Hong Kong, as we both know well. Yeah, and and like again, look at me, just for the audience, at that time you were still a youngster, pretty much, right? It, it's like the first yep. time you're out of, out of the country, you know, you just lost your job. You're trying to really stay alive, keep yourself going. So I that's really the was for getting that job. And again, I applaud you because, hey, you know, when I go and get stuff, the, the, the top get going. Yeah, I just needed to make some money. And I was trying to communicate with rich people. Yeah. But now here I was where my job description was just to basically have fights, you know? And so I thought to myself, is this the worst position I've ever been in? But the funny thing was, and this is, I think, the same with all entrepreneurs, you learn the most from when things go wrong. 
Of you course. don't learn the most when it's going well and it's successful. You know, you write, you it's write 100%, that. totally. Yeah. So I'm in this dark moment of my life thinking I've tried to become something better, but I haven't. But all of a sudden working in this club, I got to see rich people come in the club. I got to see poor people come in the club. I got to see poor people pretending they were rich. I got to see all these different kinds of people. And the funny thing is, it gave me like a PhD in, in human psychology. I got to see, it became the best thing that could have happened to me. And because I was a doorman, I knew of a new nightclub opening or a new party. So I would start talking to the richer clients going, hey, are you going to the party Thursday night? And they'd be like, oh, I, I can't get in. I don't know anyone. And I'd be like, look, 500 bucks and I'll get you in. And it started small like that. But I became the guy that could get you into all the private parties that you didn't know about. Um, purely and simply because if I wasn't being asked to be on the door, one of my friends were. So I knew where the doormen were was the party. It, it's, and, it's so true. Yeah. Fascinating, fascinating way of getting in a business where you create something where there's a huge need for. But again, yep. you needed to be there. I doubt that in your original line of business back in construction, the family business back in Newcastle, you would have had that need from your peers. I mean, it really took you a lot of guts, oh, yeah. you know, effort, you know, to make it from the UK to Hong Kong, which obviously, as everybody knows as well, is the financial center of pretty much Southeastern Asia. You know, massive, massive hub with millionaires and billionaires concentrated on that tiny piece of land, you know, which is, yep. which is Hong yep. Kong. And then again, when there is a need, hey, you know, when there is demand, you know, you create, you accommodate those clients, creating exceptional and unforgettable experience and eventually really taking it to the level where you would have that emotional, emotional uh, link, if you will, with the clients, where the clients would come and speak with you and share some very personal issues, asking you to customize and tailor a very specific experience. Right. Um, exactly. You've got to, uh, you've got to want it. You've got to demand it. I demanded it and it put me in a completely different country. Um, I wasn't willing to sit there in England. I needed to go where it could possibly be better. Even if I failed, I learned what I failed at. And so I took all the education from my failures and just went out. And the more I got to converse with rich people, they started asking me for things and I never started the concierge firm. Right. You know, I had been doing what I was doing as, you know, the go-to guy, the fixer, whatever you want to call me, right. you know, right. the man that can, I've been doing this for like eight years until one day someone said to me, Oh, I hear you're the concierge that can get everything done. And I was thinking concierge. Is that Let's what I'm capitalizing that? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, formalize so that's, that. So that's what happened. I never called myself a concierge. I never called myself anything. I just right. connected your request to what needed to be done. And I would charge you accordingly. I always charged people. Of um, course. And it took off. Uh, but again, understand the concierge business was not a business I was trying to build up. The business I was trying to build up was knowledge. I was trying to understand what made you successful? And I noticed a few things that actually came up. And I'll give you two of them. I'll give you two things that make the difference between a rich person and a poor person. Let me okay? hear. The first one is they think differently by valuing time differently. They know they can make more money. So true. They, they can't make more time. Therefore, what they do with that time has to be more rewarding, more fulfilling. So you'll get someone that's not successful. And that's a key thing to understand. Successful people start with a successful mindset. There's no one rich that's not successful, okay? And there's no one successful that's not wealthy. But they have to start with that successful mindset and then the money comes. It's like, it's like driving down the road at 100 mile an hour and then looking out your passenger window you're going to crash into something. So you have to steer the car with a successful mindset. 
Look at every hour of your day and go, okay, what can I achieve, grow, develop from this hour? And it's like if you go to a party with a bunch of poor people, and I know that sounds disrespectful, but let's be blunt. That's what it is. If you go to a party and there's a bunch of guys in there with no money, they're going to ask you, what are you drinking? What are you watching on TV? Where are you going on holiday? Last it's all game, kind of, yeah. Like really yeah. meaningless conversations that lead nowhere. Time killing, you know, drain your brain, suck your yep. energy. <laughs> yep. But if you're in a room full of successful people, they'll ask you, what are you working on? What are you developing? What are you trying to focus on? What's your next goal? What's your next ambition? What went wrong and what did you learn? It's almost like getting interviewed. And so I noticed straight away, successful people value time differently to non-successful people. And then the second thing they do, when things go wrong for successful people, they lean into it because they know that's where the education is. So you'll get someone that will try and do a business, lose money, and they will lean back, hold their head, throw a pity party and cry and go, oh, I've lost all my money. A successful person, when it goes wrong, they will physically lean in to see where it went wrong. And they will pick out those little nuggets of education and wisdom because we all know experience comes three minutes after you needed it. Experience is developed by things going wrong. And it that's is, where they get their education from. It is so true, Steve. And I can't agree with you more because we're in a completely different lines of business, but we're probably working with very similar uh, kind of clientele where I know from my personal experience, from the experience of many, many, many of my successful and accomplished clients that, hey, you know, there is no success without failure or multiple failures. You know, you really need to break a lot of things to get to that understanding, hey, you know, this is where I was wrong. This is what needs to be done differently going forward. And then eventually that's how you capitalize on those mistakes. And, and that's how you propel yourself in your yep. business to the next level. You know, great line, obviously, is there are no limits. The limits begin where the vision ends. And I know that you've been sticking with those fundamentals, uh, you know, pretty much all of your life, professional life at least. Uh, and, uh, and that's uh, commendable. I really would like uh, to kind of like switch gears just a, big, uh, just a bit and speak about, you know, some of the clients, we don't need to go into the names, obviously. I, I mentioned a couple of them, Sir, Alton, uh, Sir Elton John, you know, and Andrea Bocelli that you have been interacting with, uh, you know, on a professional basis, obviously. Uh, but I, I forgot, was it from your book or one of your interviews where you described, you know, pretty much in depth, the experience where you had a client who was looking for a very exquisite dinner with his significant other, his wife, his lady friend, in Florence. The case may be, and they wanted to have that dinner in Tuscany. And then again, without having an intimate knowledge and understanding like you did at that time, hey, you know, everything is kind of like family run business restaurants. So you're not going to have a unique experience. You're not going to have. So please speak along those lines about that specific case. Sure. Uh, I had a client that asked me, as you say, wanted to have a dining experience in Florence, Tuscany. Um, and that was it. That was all he asked me. Um, and the way that my head works, and I do this now with my coaching clients, I try to see how far can we take it to become in the territory of laughable? How can we go for a goal that's so ridiculous that it will make people giggle at it? And then you use that to fuel it yourself to actually go and try and achieve it. Never use the word impossible in your vocabulary. You're just confirming that it can't be done, okay? Even if you think you're joking, you've clarified that if you say it, you're correct. So I thought, how can I make this ridiculous? How can I go for something so stupid people will openly mock me? So if it's gonna be in Florence, where's the most iconic place in Florence? It's the museum that houses Michelangelo's David, okay? It's like we're, if you're in, world famous, absolutely iconic. Yeah. yeah. If you're in Paris, <laughs> no, it doesn't. That's the point. Yeah, if can't you're exceed in Paris, it, can't eclipse it. Yeah, that, that's the pinnacle. <laughs> if you're in Paris, you go with the Eiffel Tower. If you're in New York, maybe the Statue of Liberty. If you're in London, maybe Buckingham Palace or Big Ben. Try and find something that cannot be replicated anywhere else. Right. And in Florence, it's David. So I tried to find out, could I turn an entire museum 
into a dinner for six people that night. And it's incredible. And I did. I managed to get it. So I convinced them to do it for me. We had six people at the feet of Michelangelo's David having dinner. And I told them I would get a local entertainer to serenade them during their dinner. Well, as they're having their dinner, I had Andrea Bocelli come in and serenade them. So that was the kind of thing that I put together because when someone asks me something, I'm not gonna give it to them. I'm gonna listen to the request and then I'm gonna give them what they lust, dream and desire for. I'm gonna try and challenge what they requested to give them what they actually want. And it's amazing because today, people don't communicate openly. You don't sadly tell the truth. If you say to someone, what would you really love? What would you really want more than anything in the world? The answer you get is probably one that they're okay about you hearing to make them look okay. They may want to kind of open up a, a house for like, you know, adopted cats. Right. But they're not going to tell you that because they don't want to be laughed at. So people don't tell you the truth today. They tell you what you want to hear or what makes them sound smarter. It's your job to challenge that conversation to really get to understand what it is the client's after. It's a fascinating approach, and, and I truly applaud it, Steve. I, you know, I, I know countless number of psychiatrists, you know, shrinks of all types and designations. And in New York City, which is probably the most troubled city in the world, as you can imagine, the number has been growing exponentially, especially over the last year and a half. Uh, they may have all the titles. I, I, I really am having a hard time of thinking of somebody without any kind of background, especially in that field like yourself, who would have such a deep understanding of human nature, but more importantly, what it would take to really get into a person's head uh, to get uh, where you're trying to be as far as, you know, uncovering the thoughts and, uh, and emotions. Uh, and that's why, obviously, you have been so successful in creating that emotional you know, link with your clients and, and taking the relationship to a totally different level. And once the client is happy because you make that dream come true. So you made that 50 or 60 year old client feel like he's a five year old kid again. Yep. And he is, uh, he is back to the, the Wizard of Oz, but this is a real life uh, Wizard of Oz. Uh, and, and again, your transparency and, uh, and the position, hey, you know, you never wanna under deliver, you always under promise, and then you over deliver, you exceed your client's expectations. And this is what ultimately creates that absolutely amazing, unforgettable experience. And that's what the clients truly appreciate. And hopefully that leads to repeat business, not only from those, you know, existing clients, but they probably become your biggest spokespeople, your biggest PR people screaming to their peers within their circle as we discussed and agreed upon, hey, you know, you're not catering to the whole world population. <laughs> there is too many billions of people, but really a very exquisite, very high end type of clientele who A, have enough funds to support, to support those dreams and B, they do realize it makes no sense of wasting days or weeks or months trying to get where they're trying to get. Uh, instead, they will choose to come to the professional like yourself, which will make those things happen. Um, another fa fascinating example of what you have done to the clients was the wedding, uh, the wedding in Vatican, I guess, right? Where the people wanted to get married in, in Vatican. So I would like you to speak about that. I really would like to have the audience, you know, actually purchase the book because it is so <laughs> full of those wonderful, wonderful, uh, you know, fascinating and inspiring stories. But, you know, let, let's touch upon that briefly, at least. Well, sadly, because of the size of the Vatican, there's not too much that I can talk about. But um, <laughs> I was asked... I was asked by a very powerful client to get him uh, married in the Vatican and blessed by the Pope. Um, and so that, that was what we were trying to, to pull off. So I was stationed over in um, uh, Italy. I was there for about six months going through the red tape to uh, put this all together. It was an incredible uh, education. Um, and I would, I would go down now, since I don't, I don't have the concierge firm anymore, since the book, I now you know, coach and speak around the world. But I, I can tell you quite simply, if I still had the concierge firm, I would never do that again. 
uh, the Vatican is a very interesting place to work with. Um, At least, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, it will definitely, as I say, there's more things I can't talk about than I can talk about. Of course, but I, yeah. I would never repeat that. What an experience. What an experience. Again, you know, how would you just proceed with that? Hey, you know, you, you call your associate. Hey, you know, can you get the Pope on the line for me? Let's have a conversation. Well, you see, there's the daft thing. Um, let's break that down, because there's a lot of people that that ask that question. You know, I was in Los Angeles when I got that request. Um, so what's the point of me asking someone in L.A. about something in Italy? The first thing you do is you phone someone in Italy and go, do you know anyone? Not that knows the Pope, that knows the Vatican. And you work your way up through the connections. I think we went through probably about 12, 18 connections to get into the vicinity that I needed to be in. So the daft thing is, most people will look at the end goal. Most people will look at Elton John, Richard Branson, the Pope, right. and they will try to connect with them. Try to connect with the people around them that can right. introduce you to them. And so it's very simple, you know, fundamentals and basics that people just ignore and they get scared. They go, oh, I can't contact the Pope. Whoa, right. and I'm not going to do it. That's the silly thing. You know, the first thing you should do is look at the people that's orbiting the person you need and go for them. Interesting, interesting. And the fact itself that you're an Irish Catholic would not give you any slap with that, right? No, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I thought I would have got bonus points for being that, but... No, that didn't help at all. <laughs> yeah, for our audience, uh, Steve Sims uh, has been a proud uh, resident and lately became a very proud American citizen. God bless America. So as we both know, uh, Irish uh, biggest uh, expert is the Irish talent, you know, the human, the human talent. Uh, and we have happen to have so many more Irish folks here in the U.S. than back in Ireland, either it's part of the UK or, you know, Ireland proper. And I understand the difference because I have very good friends and clients from both ends you know, of the spectrum. But yeah, yeah, congratulations to you on those wonderful, uh, wonderful Thank developments you. in your life. So, uh, you know, the fact that you kind of like uh, wrapped up your uh, concierge business and you migrated into consulting and coaching because obviously there was a huge demand, you know, based on the network that you developed over years and decades of flying across the world, you know, meeting corporate executives, you know, business people. So you want to talk about that aspect of your business, Steve? Yeah, it was kind of weird. As I said to you, I never expected the book to do anything for me. Um, in fact, quite the opposite. I wanted the book to do things for you. Um, I wanted people to read the book and understand that you don't have to be super intelligent, super connected to do these things. You just start off by trying them. And so... We put the uh, book together, Bluefish in The Art of Making Things Happen. And I was quietly proud of the book and thought, eh, this would be nice. You know, I've written a book, that's lovely. Right. But all of a sudden it became demanding. Um, people were like, oh, I love this. Can you, can you teach us? Can you do a course? Can you do a community? Can you do private events? Can you speak at our training event can you speak on stage at an annual event um and i literally have traveled in like a two-year period thailand hong kong spain canada uh, europe all over america mexico speaking and training people on how to do things differently so one of the things had to go my concierge firm right. or this new firm and the concierge firm spent billion uh, spent billionaires money to give right. them interesting cocktail stories. Right. Now, I work with entrepreneurs on how to brand, market, uh, and promote their business, their right. solution, what they stand for. It's much more rewarding. And I get so much pleasure out of helping entrepreneurs become better because then it doesn't just impact them. It benefits all the people that work with them. So... That's what I do. I consult. I do speakeasies. I have an online community called simsdistillery.com. Those are the things that I do. And I'm working on a book number two. Well, th those are absolutely fascinating developments. And I truly and sincerely congratulate you on them. Uh, 
you're truly doing the work of the Lord, I would say, in, in my strong opinion, uh, really spreading those pearls of wisdom. And as you pointed out, really educating people, you know, educating businesses, allowing them to grow, you know, hire more people, supporting the local economies, being the US, UK, Europe, or Asia. You know, the country is overall, they're so much better off and stronger, you know, when more people have jobs and, and people like yourself, yeah. corporate consultants, you know, corporate coaches, they contribute uh, immensely uh, to those kind of developments. Uh, uh, fascinating, fascinating. Uh, a couple of closing uh, words of, uh, you know, before we wrap it up. I know you have a client meeting as you, uh, as you told me right before we started this interview. Yeah, I just want people to try something. If you haven't tried something, you've got to be prepared to fail. Now, you don't have to lose your house when you fail. You could try a different restaurant. You could try a different route to work. You could try a different radio station. If you just get your brain used to the fact that you're trying different things, it will start receiving different uh, signals which come in the form of opportunities. It's like the classic, someone comes to your house with a car and you go, well, that's an interesting color. I've never seen that before. And then the following day on the highway, that's the only color you can see because your mind's been opened up to recognize it. So if you get your mind uh, just uh, stretched by trying different things, that's where the opportunity and the growth is going to come back to you. So true. So true. Don't sit on your back. Don't wait for the miracles to happen. Just get out of your seat. Get out of your place. Open up your eyes. Open up your mind and pursue your dreams. Make things happen. It, it is so true. Uh, so true. Uh, we're going to post all the information of how the audience can get in touch with you, Steve. But just a couple of uh, couple of links that you want to mention. What's the easiest way to get in touch with you? SteveDSims.com. There's a, a D for dashing and there's only one M in Sims. So SteveDSims.com or follow me on Instagram at SteveDSims. And we're connected on both Instagram and LinkedIn, obviously. And I'm going to post those and a couple other links, uh, how the, the post can get in touch with you and benefit from what you have to share. Uh, again, can't thank you enough for carving the time out of your ultra busy schedule, Steve, to come and join us today. And to the audience, uh, folks, thank you very much again for uh, tuning in uh, straight and filter. It will be here very soon again. And in the meantime, uh, keep pushing, keep pushing through, keep staying strong, uh, stay positive, stay strong, and uh, good things will keep happening. All right, until the next time, see you soon, folks.